It's showtime, a-holes. Welcome to a new episode of a new show, kind of a spin-off show from the main show. Welcome to Movies and Me Extra. Now, guys, you know what Movies and Me is like now. We talk about the movies that are personal to you and why you love them, but I actually want to talk about uh, some of the movies that are coming out in theaters now, and surprisingly, this is the first one I wanted to talk about. I did not expect Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 to be the first one, but of course... I can't do anything without an incredible guest to back me up with it. He's seen Guardians a week earlier than me. He's the host of the Horror House podcast, the Purple Dawn Enlightenment Hour, and comic book flick through. Please welcome back Morgan Robinson. Hello, hello. I'm very honoured to be the first guest, of course. Very nice intro, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know, a little bit of Movies and Me trivia. Morgan was actually supposed to be the first ever guest on Movies and Me, but... Due to scheduling issues, we had to get Billy Paulahan to take his place, but he ended up being episode two instead. But good to have you back, buddy. I feel like the tide has now been uh, corrected, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, absolutely. I like that you phrase it as though Billy was always second to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just realized that sounded like a complete dick move. Billy, I love you so much. I love you so freaking much. <laughs> Anyways, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I just saw it yesterday, you saw it a week before me, and do you want to talk about what we were expecting from Guardians, like, um, leading up to it? Because, you know, I was not very excited for this movie. Yeah, I mean, I, as Guardians, I really do, it is one of my favourite of the whole Marvel cinematic universe nonsense. Um, but, uh, yeah, Guardians 2, it was feeling like... It was going to be much of the same, which I suppose can be read in a good and bad way, because more of the first Guardians is great, but then, you know, it runs the risk of being too samey. So I was looking forward to it, absolutely. Uh, I never expected it to be as sort of memorable as the first one was for me, and so in that sense, my expectations were met. Yeah, I think I kind of felt the same way. Uh, I was really worried that this was going to be another Age of Ultron situation where, like, it's still fun, but it does feel a bit like more of the same. But luckily, there is some parts that give fans of the first Guardians what they want, but it also added a kind of new fresh layer to the family element, which we'll get into when we get into the spoiler discussion. But what are your overall, like, spoiler-free thoughts on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? Because I know you did a review for it before we even started recording this. Yes, um, you know, that is the benefit of being in the UK and seeing, for some reason, this a week earlier than everyone else. Um, yeah, spoiler-free thoughts would be Guardians 2 is very fun. It's very entertaining. If you love Guardians, you will very much like Guardians 2. It's not the first one. Quite as much action as the first one. I think I wanted to. I do want to talk about the opening credits as well of both of them. Go, I, um, go right ahead. Necessarily spoilers. That's not necessarily spoilers. So yeah, Guardians Two opening credits is uh, Baby Group dancing. Guardians One's Guardian One's opening credits is of course the sort of dark. Star Lord, all this, and then it just your love and Chris Pratt starts dancing, and it's all fun. Uh, so, third in the first one, um, say the the layer that they add in is very much appreciated, and it does take the series into a a, a more deep sort of, of a fresher tone like you said um although i didn't necessarily prefer well, that's a, that's a fair enough point i mean me and you kind of look at movies in a different way like i'm always looking for stuff where it's like i don't mind necessarily what story elements it takes but as long as you make me like the characters they can do anything and i think this movie really succeeds at that so before we head into spoiler talk is there anything else that you want to mention just before we head there well i like what i like that that you say you always find um, you always look for decent characters above sort of a decent story, which is you know perfectly fine. Um, even some of in uh, 
in Guardians 2. Even some of the, namely Drax, really. Some of the stuff he, he was he did, some of the stuff he was saying, um, all of it, but felt just slightly off to me, whereas that wasn't the case in the first one. Uh, so that was another sort of minor, yeah, very, very enjoyable movie. Let's talk spoilers. Okay, well, um, I think this is something we were both excited about, but Kurt Russell is in this movie playing Star-Lord's dad, Ego the Living Planet, and talk a bit about how much we love Kurt Russell. That guy's an incredible freaking actor. Kurt Russell has been my life ever since I first saw Kurt Russell. You know, the man owned the 1980s action genre completely. In, in this, he completely stole the film for me. I thought he was by far the best part of Guardians 2. And, um, of course, if we are now talking spoilers, which we are. Indeed we are. Kurt Russell, Ego, the Living Planet, is the main villain of, you know, it's it's like the, the father, something I obviously love. But yeah, that, like you said before, this family dynamic that he's brought in between Star-Lord and Ego is really interesting because it, like, it shows a bit of Ego's, uh, as well, how he met uh, Peter Quill's mother uh, and all that stuff. And it sort of makes you Ego for a bit until he starts getting a bit maniacal and I want to rule the entire universe like you do. Yeah, and... Um, uh, surprisingly it was kind of a fresh take on the whole i want to destroy the universe thing because you know what i was like before this came out i was like if they make star lord's dad the villain i will absolutely love it but i somehow think they're not gonna go with that angle but i was really surprised when everything that was kind of pointing to ego's planet just seemed off you know there was something really kind of this world is too perfect kind of feel for that. You get that in a lot of movies nowadays. Yeah, it was a very... Ego's planet itself is a beautiful thing to look at. Visuals, really. Uh, like you said, though, it is slightly too perfect. There's nothing that is on Ego's planet. And obviously that is because he is the planet, but he likes to take over things. A lot of things, and... Um... Just while we're on the subject of Ego, i got to bring up Mantis into this. Where do you really stand on her? Because I thought she was like a, a sort of a fun little extra addition to the team, but I kind of wish that her and Ego had more scenes together because that would have really showed like their relationship and made that interesting. Because at one point, she, she basically says that I'm like his pet. And the way that uh, Ego is presented in this movie, I think that would have been a cool dynamic to explore further. Yeah, I completely agree with that, actually. Mantis, uh, I think, good in small doses. Slightly aggravating tone of delivery after a while, I think. Um, that's not necess- that Again, that is not a big negative by any means. But yeah, I, I like what you said. See more scenes with her and Ego. Yeah, and there was something that I noticed when I was thinking about this. Uh, Remember how Star-Lord was at the beginning of the first Guardians? Like, he's just sleeping with women and doing all this stuff, but then once he meets the other Guardians, he kind of becomes more of, like, a full-fleshed-out person, and Ego is introduced as kind of the same thing, but he takes it to, like, a whole different level, and he even admitted that he fell in love with Meredith Quill, but... He, because he was falling in love, he knew that, and he's like, I don't want to be considered weak. Like, he considered love a kind of a weakness, and in one of the most shocking moments that I really did not expect from this movie, reveals that he was the one who put the tumor in Meredith Quill's brain. And did that shock you at all? Yeah, very, very much so. I uh, I was quite taken aback. I was like, oh, Kurt Russell, you evil. Yeah, I was not expecting that. Like, obviously, we'd know we'd known at that point that Ego was gonna become the main villain, and it would be some sort of big battle. Very good. Uh, but yeah, the whole I put the tumor in your mother's brain because 
was almost hindering my universal domination because I loved her so much. Very sort of, uh, very dark, actually. I was not expecting that. I very much appreciated that, though. Another reason why Kurt Russell stood out to me. Yeah, and um, with the element of fathers in this movie, we can't not talk about Yondu because besides Ego... Yondu was a really big surprise in this movie as well. Like, you sort of have the element of it takes one thing to be a father, but an entirely different thing to be a dad. And that's shown really well with Yondu's character in this movie. Precisely. Yondu, Yondu is Jaquil's dad. He is. He raised him. Ego had nothing to do with it. Ego was evil as hell and left him with Yondu. Yondu raised Peter Quill to be who he is. And that is why he's always. You know, that is why Yondu is always seen by the other Ravagers as sort of favouring, which, you know, they, they have a nice affection for each other. I really, I really like that. Yondu was a lot cooler in Guardians 2 than I ever remember him being in the first one as well. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And there's one point near where Ego and Star-Lord are having this battle, because as you know, if you've seen the movie, it's revealed that Star-Lord is part celestial, so he has this god-like power, and Ego wants him to be able to do that with him and rule the universe together as father and son. I'm sure that's very similar to another franchise that you also love. Yes, let's rule the galaxy as father and son. Uh, Yeah, I love it. (laughs) And when they're in this final battle... The line that is given before Ego is destroyed just kind of spoke to me is that Ego sees that he's clearly lost this battle and he's like, don't do this. You could be a god and you if you kill me, you'll be just like everyone else. And Star-Lord's response was just perfect. What's so wrong with that? Like, I was freaking cheering the minute that happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. Star-Lord's got his... His own little, well, he's never known anything any different. And thrown this immortality card out of absolutely nowhere yesterday. Perfectly happy just being Star Lord, just mortal, normal mortal Star Lord that he always thought he was. Uh, yeah, I do like that. What is wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Exactly, and. Um... Now we're getting into the point that shocked me the most because you watch a lot of these Marvel movies and you kind of know that the characters are going to survive because, you know, they've been booked up for other ones in the future. But Star-Lord and the Guardians of the Galaxy successfully defeat Ego, but there's only one space suit available and it's between Yondu and Star-Lord and Yondu knows he's going to die, but he gives Star-Lord that thing anyway. And that had me in tears. Because this guy is yeah. presented as like a thief and like a scumbag and they're all they're always fighting, but before Yondu kind of lets the Guardians go away, he says like let me do this one good thing, and I didn't really expect Yondu to die. And weirdly enough, it felt like something happened in a Marvel movie, if you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. Yondu's death came as a shock to me. It was very powerful death. Uh, actually, because I remember a similar scene in the first one when they're sort of floating out in space and it looks like Star-Lord himself, actually, but it looks like, you know, he's all his skin's going scaly and like Yondu's did in this. And, but obviously in the first one, nobody dies. Um, but yeah, very, very powerful death and a very beautiful funeral as well, featuring one Sylvester Stallone. I was disappointed with the lack of screen time Sylvester Stallone got. I was so excited to see him, and we got him for like two scenes and like a 20 second end credit scene, and I wanted more. Well, uh, I agree with that, but at least we got a lot more of Kurt Russell, so I'll forgive them for that. Maybe they'll have Stallone in the third one doing more stuff, but uh, one more thing I want to mention, because we haven't really talked about the other Guardians in this movie, but Rocket... Drax and Groot and Gamora and, and even Nebula now all sort of have their own little arcs that connect with each other. And it really, it sells the theme of this movie being about a dysfunctional family that 
needs to work towards their differences and work together to save the galaxy. And I thought that was done a lot better in this movie, in its execution, than it even was in the first one. Yeah, absolutely. I really did like the Gamora Nebula sort of side plot of obviously their sisters and we get for Nebula, of course, because we see just what Thanos has actually done to her. Uh, in the past, she tells us that, and sort of her and Gamora almost bond uh, slightly in this, because obviously they don't like each other at the start. But that, yeah, that was nice to see them two coming together. Rock, and then Rocky obviously starts having arguments with Star Lord, and then that, that's going to sort itself out. But yeah, it just dysfunctional thing. Um, Baby Group was just there to be cute. Didn't do a great deal. He's made um, for merchandise. Very cute. Exactly. I mean, that's fine. We can accept that. Uh, Drax, again, sort of... I have 25 on Drax time. I did laugh at stuff he said. I do. I did. I, I did, in fact, like his... Um, Relationship with Mantis. Same I here. That was kind of cute at the start. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Some of the stuff, there's one line in particular. He starts talking about how there's so much like a family. We know that. You don't have to. Which sort of took me out of it for slight, for like 30 seconds or so. But yeah, I, I mean, I like, I like Drax. I like all, the, I like all these Guardians. That's why. You know, that's why I like these films. And uh, there's a couple more scenes that I do want to bring up before we get into the after credits scene. Uh, there's one that's uh, just kind of... You know I like small moments in movies that say a lot? When uh, Taserface, and this is the only time I'm going to mention Taserface because I think I think he just exists to be ridiculous, but they're, the Ravagers kind of have this little like, mutiny thing over leadership and... They're killing all the other Ravagers that don't necessarily agree with them. And there's just this one kind of scary shot of them all floating in space, dead. And this guy, who's, I think it's played by James Gunn's brother. I can't exactly remember his name, but he's just looking at it. And he's not seeing other Ravagers dead. He's seeing his friends being dead. And that also really spoke to me in this movie. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that, actually. Um... Because I sort of, I'd almost blanked the whole ridiculous taser face nonsense out of my, my mind. But yeah, that uh, name actually, that character's name, but I, I know what you mean. Yeah, and uh, it's it's kind of interesting to see Yondu and Rocket kind of, they're kind of like two sides of the same coin, whereas you see Rocket's pretty much just like an asshole, but he's doing that to cover his own insecurities, and Yondu kind of does the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Seemingly, like, you don't think about that necessarily. They are quite similar characters in a way. Although, kind of more... I don't know. Rocket's kind of more cocky. Sort of... He has power. He, he has charm. and so He has a lot of charisma. That Rocket just sort of... He's very quippy and cool, but yeah. I do love that whistling arrow. I I would buy that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, since we brought up Nebula before, uh, I actually forgot to mention her line. What well, Nebula and Gamora are having a fight, and she just says, out of, in like a rage, I just wanted a sister. It was the first time yes. I was really seeing the layers behind Nebula, and I, I want to see more of her. I want to see that relationship grow. Exactly, you know, that's what I was talking about before with her and, uh, you know, Gamora bonding. That line, definitely but another very powerful line in uh, in this film. Absolutely. A lot of family stuff, a lot of family stuff. And um, I think that's uh, nearing the wrap us up, but let's talk about some of the uh, end credits scenes and, of course, Stan Lee's cameo. We've got from yeah. this, and the first time I'm ever going to mention it, and the last time I'm going to mention it, these gold people finally did something in the end credits scenes that mattered. Adam Warlock's coming. 
I'm freaking psyched for that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, the gold people weren't necessarily standouts. They had the little video game spaceship thing. I don't know. Not, not, not a standout, but that the end credit scene that did stand out from. So actually, not the Stanley one. It was the the teenage group. <laughs> Angsty Groot. <laughs> that was so it was well hilarious. done. Hilarious. Exactly. It was as though Groot was my own brother right now, <laughs> because my brother, my brother, basically is like that. Lord's <laughs> coming into his bedroom, tidying here. Would you clean up your vines? It's just like mm, no. <laughs> Playing on his little whatever, whatever he was playing on. Very, very funny. I loved that. I hope that they have well, teenage Groot in the third one. Oh, I definitely want teenage angsty teenage moody Groot in the Guardians Three. That is exactly what we want. And uh, of course, the other uh, end credit scene that was a nice little nod, but I'm not sure if they're going to follow up with it in Guardians Three. I hope they do. Sylvester Stallone and his team are members of the original Guardians team from the comics, and. I'm not sure if you know this, but Miley Cyrus actually voiced one of them. I did not know that. I did not know that at all. Yeah, I believe she is a character called Mainframe. It's probably the one that looked kind of like robotic, kind of. And I don't know. Do you want to see Guardians 3 be like a team up between the old Guardians and the new ones, plus going up against Adam Warlock? Hey, I would, like I said before, any more Stallone I'm down for. So... Give me more Stallone and I'll be happy. Do if we're going to team up with Stallone, please team up with Stallone. Of course. I'm down for that. And finally, we'll talk about the Stan Lee cameo, which is surprisingly very fun and connective, is that I don't know how they pulled this off, but Stan Lee in this is an astronaut who's talking with the Watchers. It's not Uatu the Watcher, because I think Fox owns that character, but like a generic Watcher kind of person. And He's talking about all the stories that he's had, but they're his other cameos in the movies. So this proves every Stan Lee ca- ha- cameo is connected. Yeah, he Stan Lee is character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He is a Watcher style character. He's always there. It's always the same guy. The came- this cameo was kind of the one cameo that actually felt like it was worth actually being there in terms of in terms of story and sort of at least i always love the stanley cameo of course but yeah i was really to see this whole fan theory of stanley as a watcher actually become true and uh, i hope that's like one little step further to getting the fantastic four back to the mcu because that brand belongs with marvel like We've already seen what they're doing with Spider-Man. If they can do that with Fantastic Four, I'm absolutely down. But, I, mean, I can see it happening in the next couple of years. Okay, we're nearing the wrap-up stage now, so uh, like we do on Movies and Me, uh, Morgan, what's the... Uh, if you could describe maybe in one sentence or so, what do you say to get people to go see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 this weekend? I say... Did you like Guardians Volume 1? Did you like the humour in Guardians Volume 1? This has that, along with some dramatic elements. And, uh, of course, um, thank you so much for joining me for this first episode of uh, Movies and Me Extra. Uh, Where can the good people find you, and is there anything that you want to plug? Well, the good people, as you call them so lovingly, can always find me on Twitter at ThePurpleDom. Or on uh, Purple Dawn YouTube channel, where you will find Horror House, uh, which of which there is a new episode going up tomorrow with Six Degrees' own Stacey Howard. It was fantastic to record with her. She's such a delight. Uh, I can't wait for everybody to hear that episode. Um, on that channel, you will, of course, also find the Purple Dawn Enlightenment Hour and comic book flick through... Um, yeah, find both podcasts also on iTunes. Just search for title. Find them there. 
Yeah, and uh, as always, you guys can catch me at Nolan Dean Twenty Seven, and I hope you guys enjoyed this new episode of a, the show that I'm trying out. I really want to try and branch out, so uh, use the hashtag Movies and Me Extra to continue the conversation about Guardians Two, and leave us a comment below. What did you think of Guardians Two? As always, if you like this show, hit the subscribe button, and I will see you guys next time. <laughs>